Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're able to join us for our next edition of the 49er Industry Chats. My name is Noemi Guevara and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Cal State Long Beach. Before we start our session today, I would like to let you know it is being recorded and it will live in our video library housed under csuob.edu forward slash alumni. Also, if you have questions for our speaker today, we encourage you to use the Q&A box located below that helps us um, to moderate the questions coming through and keep track to make sure we answer all of our questions. Um, so now I would like to introduce your moderator, Lucia Paz, who graduated in 1975 from the College of Liberal Arts with a degree in Spanish, Spanish and was recognized as a distinguished alumni in 2005 and now serves on our CSUB alumni um, board. Thank you so much, Lucia, for joining us today. Great. Well, I welcome you all, and um, uh, today we have David Logan Hader, who is a proud Long Beach State alum. Uh, he earned his BA in Japanese History and International Studies back in 2014. He is an international educator. In fact, uh, he's 14 hours uh, ahead of us right now in Vietnam, and uh, so uh, we're lucky to, to, to grab him at the right time. And he is not only an international educator specialized in teaching English as a foreign language, but he's also current uh, and he's living and he's currently living in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. But he's also involved in a lot of other things that you'll hear about. He'll be sharing those with you. He participated in the Yoka Ichi English Fellows Program, an exclusive teaching opportunity for Long Beach Unified School District teachers and Long Beach State graduates. Uh, the Fellows uh, serve as assistants. Also, language uh, teachers at uh, the elementary and middle school levels in Long Beach Sister City, Yokaichi, Japan. I hope I'm saying that right. In addition yeah, to good. the educational and leadership experience gained, David developed skills and knowledge in different industries through volunteering and collaborative uh, projects. Joining us today from Vietnam uh, to lead our industry chat is David Logan Hater. So, hey, uh, what should I say? Good evening. It's morning for me, so I'll say good morning. Uh, my name's David, and let's see, it looks like we can start our chat this morning. So I'll share the screen and then we'll get going. So yeah, I have um, a lot of pictures on here and we'll just kind of breeze through them really quick. Uh, just for the sake of time, we wanna spend more time answering questions. So if you think of a question, maybe write it down or type it in and if time permits, we'll do it on the spot. If not, we'll definitely take it at the end. So let's get started. All right, so like I said, I'm uh, David Logan Hader. Uh, I'm from Long Beach, California, and I graduated in 2014 with History, International Studies, and Japanese BAs. So um, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about my journey uh, from Long Beach to here and some of my educational background. So I actually went to Long Beach Poly, and I studied in a program called CIC that focused on um, international studies, right? So I studied Spanish, Japanese, and international relations. And then after that, I worked for a while. Then I went to uh, Long Beach City College where I studied uh, Japanese and East Asian culture and liberal arts. But I was there for a while. I took too many classes, right? Um, but it was kind of fun to take so many classes and see what I like, you know, even though it took a little bit longer. Um, and then after that, I transferred to Cal State Long Beach. And within those majors, I focused on Asia and the Middle East and also conflict and cultural identity. Um, I was also a part of the student media board for uh, student government, which is really cool. Um, I really recommend, like anybody that's thinking about it, join uh, ASI student government. It's a really great opportunity, and you can uh, meet a lot of people and learn skills. And then I was also a part of the uh, karate club. Yeah, so you can see we're kind of uh, recruiting club members. And I think this was like a picture at the year-end party for ASI. So it's, it's really fun. I enjoyed it. Um, also, while I was studying at Cal State Long Beach, uh, I did study abroad in Japan for one semester, and I had intensive Japanese classes that could be 15 hours a week, sometimes four and a half hours a day. And then they also had other uh, international humanities classes. 
And um, yeah, those were also pretty challenging. And it was cool because we got to meet a lot of people from many different countries around the world. Yeah, so while I was in Japan the first time, I got to climb Mount Fuji. And then uh, these are just some pictures from the town that I was in. It wasn't super big. And uh, the same way my apartment wasn't super big either. It's a little messy, <laughs> but you can see it's a tiny apartment. Uh, it's basically like one room with a hallway and a bathroom. Um, we'd always get around by bike. Uh, these are some of the Hungarian students that I would hang out with. So it's a little bit different um, living your life on two wheels. Um, I didn't have a lot of money, so every week I'd make a big pot of curry. That was my breakfast, or no, that was my lunch and dinner. And then, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to go around to in the city, kind of like old shrines and hiking trails. It was really fun. Yeah, so when I came back to Cal State Long Beach, um, I also worked with the Global uh, Studies Institute as a research assistant. It's doing a lot of different uh, things. And then I also helped uh, to campaign to save a few programs they're trying to cut due to, I think, probably budget constraints, which were wilderness, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, wilderness studies and Japanese. And um, I also joined the Japan Club. Yeah, so wilderness studies is really cool. Uh, they had camping classes and also uh, kayaking. Yeah, and then I went from uh, Cal State Long Beach to teach in Japan. And then after five years there, now I'm in Vietnam. Yeah, so I just showed all this to uh, highlight that my own experience in international education was really beneficial for me, right? And I think um, Long Beach is probably one of the best places for that, you know? So, yeah. And uh, just kind of thinking about international education in general, it's really important because it promotes critical thinking. Uh, you can see things from different perspectives, come up with new solutions, and it helps you understand other cultures better and kind of develop cultural competence. Yeah. And employers are really looking for that, right? Because, um, as you've probably seen from uh, the pandemic, a lot more people are working together that wouldn't normally be working together because of geography, but now everything's moving online and you could be working with people from a lot of different countries and cultures. Yeah, so now I'll talk about um, my time in the Okaichi English Fellows Program. Yeah, so it was really fun. Um, I worked really hard too. And I learned a lot about myself, you know, kind of overcoming challenges. And I was also able to meet a lot of people from different countries, made some lifelong friends. And I think overall, when I think about what I did there, I was able to have an impact on the community, right? Because you're working with teachers and students every day, and you're kind of helping them grow over a long time. And so it was really fun. Um, so working in Japan, I said it was an assistant language teacher, just because um, it's not like an assistant in terms of work. It's more just like in terms of deciding things. So there's a main teacher that you teach classes with and you teach together as a team and then you just help them with whatever they ask you to help out with. Um, so usually we would plan a lot of lessons. Uh, we talk with the students during the breaks. Uh, we had a lot of administrative tasks like kind of uh, doing reports about the classes you taught or maybe helping with other projects. And we would also help train new teachers and do some community outreach. Yeah, so the working hours were from uh, 8.20 to 4.15, and we had to commute by bike, train, or bus. They wouldn't let us drive a car, I guess, maybe just to avoid accidents. And then usually we'd go out on the weekends. Um, you know, the town wasn't super big, so usually all you could do is uh, karaoke or go out to eat, and then maybe take a trip to a nearby town and go hiking. And then uh, we could take trips in the school uh, breaks, but you could only get vacation time when school is out. It's so it was kind of chosen for you. And then I also did a lot of uh, volunteering projects. Yeah, so uh, I'll just jump through some of these pictures really quick. This is the mascot of the city. Uh, he's kind of like, um, supposed to be like the, the baby of like a, a monk kind of monster thing. It gets really complicated. <laughs> yeah, and then this is actually uh, some pictures I took on my way to, to a school I taught at. And this is a picture from the school. Um, we taught in kindergartens. Also, uh, elementary schools were really fun. Uh, we would also teach in uh, junior high school. Are these in and Japan? Then, yes. Are these in Japan or or Vietnam? <laughs> yeah, these are in Japan still. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and um, this one was actually in the newspaper. Uh, we started doing some teacher training because 
uh, elementary schools have to teach English now. And those teachers were never really trained to teach English. So it's like, okay, we're going to get you ready. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the classes are really fun. You can goof around a little bit. Um, and then you can also go to sports clubs. So I did some martial arts. I joined the uh, judo club. Yeah. And then this is like the school lunch that I would eat every day. You can bring your own lunch. Um, but they also have big festivals like sports day, culture day. Yeah, and then um, they also have work trips too. So this is the first year and we have some other uh, CSU LB alums here. Yeah, and then there's always a lot of events like at the uh, International Center. Yeah, and then uh, this is kind of hanging out with some of my teacher friends, it was fun. And uh, it gets pretty cold in Yokaichi. You can see that's frost on my bicycle seat. I think this is like in December. And then you also have to be creative with your shopping, right? And then uh, in the kindergartens, we get to dress up like Santa Claus and give out presents. Yeah, and then always lots of karaoke. And then I'm in the, the front over here. I danced in the uh, Yosakoi Festival. Yeah, so it's really fun. And then I think if you are outgoing, there are a lot of opportunities for you to uh, do a lot of things. And so I enjoyed it. And then uh, these are some pictures from when we were volunteering. We worked as volunteer tour guides. And this is actually that uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship that got locked down. So it was kind of interesting for us to see that in the news. We really didn't expect that. Yeah. And then we also helped uh, promote local businesses like for tourism, things like that. Now, the time frame on this was um, in between semesters at Cal State Long Beach? Oh, this one is actually after you graduate. Oh, okay. And um, it's a two to five year commitment. So they ask that you stay for at least two years. Yeah. And usually the application period, like if you wanted to leave next summer, I think the applications are due maybe around like February or so right. of the same year. Yeah. Right. Okay, and so, were, um, yeah. were the schools that you were teaching in, was it private school or is it public? Oh, these were public schools. Yeah. Okay. So you're hired by the sister city and then they sponsor everything for you. Like they find you an apartment, they fly you out to Japan and then uh, you're kind of based in this uh, city hall. And then every year they decide, okay, who's going to go to what school? Like I think now there are 14 or 15 teachers and they split up 22 junior high schools. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So can, while I was. Oh. You can be working at multiple schools. Yes. Yeah. Like my first year I taught in uh, two junior high schools and one elementary school. I think overall in the five years, I probably taught at two elementary schools and about 12 junior high school. Yeah. And then uh, kindergartens, we go three times a year and I don't know how many of those I went to. It's always a different one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, Teaching abroad is great if you want to travel. Like I was able to go to uh, Vietnam, Korea, Taiwan, Spain, and also to travel around Japan. Um, and for volunteering um, with Oyama Sensei's class, uh, she was an old teacher friend of mine, and she's actually from Peru, and she would uh, help teach English to kids from South America, like Peru, Bolivia, Brazil. Um, and also I worked with a group, Santa and Friends Nagoya, and they put on a Christmas party every year for uh, some orphanages in Nagoya. And uh, I also volunteer with the website, ALT Training Online, and their uh, mission is to try to make training materials for people who teach in Japan, like doing the same job I did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the pictures you saw with the Diamond Princess were part of Omote Nashi Net Yokaichi, and they help promote local tourism. And we also volunteer as tour guides. And so I was able to work with their uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry and also work with small businesses to try to make promotional materials, websites, pamphlets, and things like that. Uh, usually it just needed somebody to translate and make sure the English was okay. So are all the schools that you've been teaching at um, using online now or were they using online before COVID? You know, I think before COVID, they had um, probably no online class. And so when COVID hit, it was like a big scramble to get online. And so I, I'm, I think in Japan, um, you know, it depends on the place. I think maybe some places never got online. And then 
um, there's kind of like a big income gap too. So some kids just never logged on the computer. And if their parents don't know how to use it, they can't teach the kids. <laughs> so I, uh, it's, I don't know, it seemed yeah. like, yeah, but their, their break kind of came towards the end of the school year and it didn't last very long either. Mm -hmm. And I think now they're kind of back to normal, but I don't know what's going to happen next. And yeah. why did you choose Japan or the Japanese culture to begin with? Mm -hmm. yeah so I feel like for me I've always kind of like Japan and Japanese culture like I grew up eating Japanese food like uh, I'd watch a lot of movies with martial arts and like Ninja Turtles and Godzilla playing video games and things like that and um, actually like I was really into Spanish when I was in high school and then I worked for a while before going back to uh, university and when I came back to university like the last Spanish class I took would be like Spanish 3 in college I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to jump into Spanish 4. So I just kind of started over with Japanese. And then uh, part of the uh, international studies program is that you have to study abroad or do an international uh, internship. And so I just kind of chose Japanese as my path. Yeah. And then um, when I was getting ready to graduate, I was looking at different types of opportunities. And I thought, hey, if I can go teach English in Japan for a while, like, you know, how, when am I ever going to get to do that again? you know, just jump on it now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So from uh, volunteering, I really recommend it, right. Uh, as a way to kind of build skills. Um, I learned how to uh, collaborate with people a lot, use a lot of resources. I uh, worked on blogging and writing, social media, marketing, video editing, web design, graphic design, uh, how to build your network of connections. Right. And it's great because you can earn skills um, without risk. Right. A lot of time, uh, people don't want to hire you because they don't want to lose money. But it's like, hey, I'll do this for free. And I'm like, well, what do you get out of it? It's like, yeah, I'm helping people and I'm learning how to do things, you know? Right. Yeah, so now um, I'm in Vietnam, right? So it's kind of the next challenge is the way I put it. And uh, so far in Vietnam, it's been a lot of fun. Um, compared to Japan and the U.S., it's super cheap, right? Like, um, if you eat like a Vietnamese person, like I can get dinner anywhere from like $1 to $3. And that's like eating out like at a restaurant, like street food. Um, but yeah, these are kind of challenging times and I'm sure everybody is aware, you know, like everything's changing. Nothing's very certain. Nobody knows exactly how things are going to go. When you left Japan, they were, mm -hmm. they were still doing in, in classroom teaching. And then towards mm -hmm. the end, it was when the COVID crisis hit. Yeah, well, actually, I left Japan last um, July, and then I went, that's it. yeah, I went back to America, and then I came to Vietnam in October. But yeah, part of it was like, okay, so come to Vietnam, and then it was like, look for an apartment, got the apartment in November, got a job in uh, December, and then I started working in January, and then like we worked for two weeks. And then they had kind of a two week break for the Vietnamese New Year. And then right after that, they shut everything down. So it was kind of bad timing. But, so in, China, yeah. in Japan, are they doing um, teaching on uh, English online now? As far as I know, I think everything is in person at the okay. moment. Yeah. Oh. Um, I think they're trying to socially distance, but yeah, yeah. I, I think it's but all happening. But in live. Vietnam right now, they are still. Where are they in the school year now? Yeah, so I think the school year is over at the moment, um, and it's supposed to start back up again in September. But um, before, like, they closed the schools down, I believe, from about uh, February, like the middle of January slash February until the beginning of May. Mm -hmm. And uh, for private schools, they went online right away, so they weren't really affected. Uh, for public schools, I think they had to extend the school year and kind of push back some tests. And um, like even compared to Japan, you know, the income gap in uh, Vietnam is much greater. And so the people who are poor are like really poor. Maybe they don't even have like a computer or a phone. And so they actually did some classes um, over TV, you know, like so the kids wake up and they'll tune in to like Channel 5 and, you know, get their math lesson for the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That, and then someone asked, um, is English losing its dominance as a world language? Uh, is Chinese in, in the Asian countries, is it gaining more, you know, in popularity? 
You know, I can see that um, being uh, the case maybe in the future, but I think right now, like English is still probably most uh, people's second or third language, right? It's still like a very international language. Um, so I could see people learning Chinese, like if they need to do a lot of business with China or um, if there are a lot of Chinese people in their area. But still, I think um, for most of the people that I've met that do international business, they all speak English pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll let you yes. continue. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. But uh, it's been fun. I've been able to learn about a uh, new culture and then uh, build on what I did in Japan. And so I'll just kind of show you some pictures really quick too, what life is like. So this is actually where I live now. And it costs about the same as that first apartment I showed you in um, Japan. But this one is like three bedrooms, three bathrooms. It has like a nice view. We have like five convenience stores around here. Um, yeah. And so I have a lot of fun with my students. Um, we do some private tutoring online. And a lot of it's either just English enrichment to try to uh, boost their skills or they're getting ready to apply to um, like an international school and they have an exam to prepare for. Are, and those then now in, I'm, mm. are those in addition to what you're getting paid for or? Uh, you oh, like uh, right now? Yeah, well, you say private tutoring classes. So mm. that's separate mm -hmm. from your in-school teaching, right? Yeah, well now um, I work for a private English center. And so it's, it's uh, kind of different. So I first applied for like a full-time job as like a manager and they're like, yeah, uh, you know a lot, but you're kind of new to Vietnam. So yeah, hold off a little bit, just kind of take it slow. I was like, okay. And so um, the first uh, job I got was only tutoring, right? And they're like, okay, so hang out. Uh, we'll find you a few students. Like for every student you have, you would teach three hours a week, you know? So if you have four students, you're teaching 12 hours a week. But then if you're not teaching, then you don't get paid, you know? So if they have vacation, like and you're kind of cash strapped, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then um, like they have other classes they teach too, but then um, a lot of those moved online. And when uh, the pandemic hit, they, they weren't really hiring more people. Um, the students' families weren't working, they couldn't pay for classes. And so it's kind of like a domino effect, you know? And yeah, so things were like really slow for me around, I want to say like March to April, you know? Yeah. So now, um, before maybe I was tutoring about four uh, students, and now I only tutor one, but then I'm teaching our uh, summer camp classes. Yeah, and so they focus on um, kind of English education, but it's not as much as like English as a foreign language like it was in Japan. It's more like uh, how you teach an English class in America, right? So there's a lot of critical thinking and projects. And then the STEAM classes are really fun because the students work together to build something, you know, try and experiment, test, an, test a hypothesis. And I don't have to do as much lesson planning in this role and they have a system for ongoing training. Yeah, so you can see the online classes. Uh, this is our summer camp class where uh, the kids had to build a boat, a boat to see how many marbles it would hold. It's like floating in a little bit of water. Um, here they're trying to build like a, a tower out of spaghetti and marshmallows, right? They wanna see who can build the biggest tower. Yeah. So uh, outside of work in Vietnam, you can go eat street food, you know, eat at the local restaurants. I'll go to the mall and watch a movie and I cruise around on my uh, motorbike. Um, I actually have a few friends that live here or you can just kind of hang out downtown. So yeah, that's my, my wheels here, you know, upgraded from the bicycle. <laughs> and uh, it's also interesting going shopping, right? You have to figure out where you're going to put everything. Um, and there are tons of motorbikes here everywhere. I think there are 8 million motorbikes in this city for 13 million people. So the traffic is crazy. You just go everywhere, you know? Um, yeah, and traveling has been interesting too. I went to the city Kentucky for New Year's and I hung out with my friend's family. Yeah, we had a, a lot of good times. So what are the, some of the pluses and minuses of, of, of you know, in terms of the listeners today mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, uh, you know, t uh, uh, teaching abroad? Yeah, so I think um, teaching abroad is great because you get a chance to travel and you get a chance to experience like a new life and a new culture. 
but um, at the same time, it can kind of be a lot of work. Um, anytime you change uh, something, it can be kind of stressful, you know, like uh, before I used to work as a security guard and my boss would say, okay, every one of you that's working here has something wrong with you, right? Like you're willing to put yourself into harm's way, <laughs> like nobody else would do that. And so I feel like it's kind of the same when you go to teach abroad, like, okay, you're going to leave your friends, you're going to leave your family to go to a place that you've never been and uh, try to learn a language you don't understand, <laughs> like, right? So it's, um, I feel like just dealing with that uncertainty and um, like knowing that you kind of have to be more independent, right? Like, hopefully if you're in a good program, you'll have good support. Um, but some people just move to a country and start looking for work and it's like, okay, you are your support system, you know? So like if you get sick, like you have to take care of yourself. Um, you know, if you're trying to go to the doctor and you, they don't speak English and like you don't speak the language, like that can be a challenge, you know? And then just things like, you know, joining a gym, uh, trying to get a bank account, you know, like just kind of those everyday things we take for granted can be challenging as well. But then you kind of end up with some funny stories too, you know, to tell people uh, back home about. Now, yeah. how, did, um, how did you get up to speed and learn Vietnamese? Yeah, so actually, um, I first visited Vietnam, I think about nine years ago in 2011. And before I went, I took a class in Long Beach City College. And um, I was like pretty good in Vietnamese and then I didn't use it and I forgot almost all of it. And then uh, now I use a uh, Duolingo, right? Like the language learning app. But even still now, like my Vietnamese isn't that great, but at least I can do things like, you know, like order food, like take a, take a taxi. Like, I like this, I don't like this, just really basic stuff. But I was actually surprised to find that, um, you know, Ho Chi Minh City is the biggest city in Vietnam and the population's pretty young and like way more people speak English than I thought would speak English, you know? And especially in certain parts of towns and like in certain malls, like I think almost everybody speaks a li at least a little bit of English, you know, even if it's not perfect. So, so I think you, mm. yeah. what drew you to Vietnam? Was it because you'd been there before and you kind of knew the language or because you didn't go back to Japan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, because after I finished my contract in Japan, right, like you could do it for a maximum of five years. I think now they uh, limited it to four years if you're from Long Beach. But um, I was kind of looking at my options. Right. And I think that's part of the thing with uh, that particular job in Japan is like you already kind of come in at the top. There isn't like a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to continue working there, like I would probably be doing the same job for uh, less pay and then working different hours. Um, if I wanted to try to get a job like at a Japanese uh, business, like not teaching English, um, like their uh, hierarchy is pretty rigid, you know, so there's a lot of like rules you have to follow and there's a lot of um, overtime, you know, and I was thinking like, you know, like it sounds good, but I don't want to get stuck into that. And uh, I was able to save up a little bit of money. And I was thinking like, okay, if I move to Vietnam, that's going to last uh, a long way. And then the country also seemed really kind of innovative, you know, and it's growing, it's developing. And so I kind of saw like an opportunity to get in before it really takes off, you know? And what some people have told me is that uh, Vietnam now is kind of what China was like 10 or 15 years ago, you know, where things were still really cheap and it didn't get too expensive yet, you know? So um, yeah. what, um, in, in terms of, um, of Vietnam and, and you know what, I forgot what I was gonna ask, so I'm gonna let you keep going. Oh, oh I okay. know what it was. Yes. Um, uh -huh. At first, I think it was, was it both in Japan and in Vietnam where you worked in a school and now you're working at a learning center? I just wanted you to kind of give us a comparison. Of oh, yes. Yeah. Which is the better way to go for those? Okay. Who yeah, so I think in Japan, like I would definitely work more and I would get paid more, but then you had less freedom, right? But it was definitely more secure. And like, you'd have things like health insurance, you know, they would find the apartment, they would get the visa, like they would kind of set up everything for you. And coming to Vietnam, I was just kind of on my own. Like, yes, they do have programs where you can sign up before you come, 
but then they can send you like pretty much anywhere in the country, you know? So like, yes, I want to be in this big city. And like, okay, you're by yourself in this like coconut farming town, <laughs> you know? And um, so it was kind of cool because I could come here and like, I just rented an apartment for a month while I looked for an apartment that I wanted to live in. But then everything that they did for me in Japan, like now I had to do for myself. So I had to get the visa, like into my own apartment, um, look for a job, like get my own transportation, you know, and those kind of things. So it's kind of a trade-off between um, like freedom and security. You know, that's the way I would kind of look at it. Right. So yeah. what's next on the horizon for you? Yeah. So now um, before uh, starting all of these teaching jobs, right? Like I got my bachelor's degree um, from the beach. And then I also got a certificate in uh, TEFL teaching English as a foreign language. And so now um, I'm actually in the process of getting my teaching credential online. And so um, once I get that, um, I can try to get jobs at international schools and they have like a really good pay, really good benefits. And <clears throat> that will actually uh, kind of help boost my teaching career because it's almost like teaching, um, like it's kind of like teaching class like you would back in the States, but you're in another country, you know? And then if I ever decide to go back to America, I can take that teaching credential and continue teaching there as well. So there's definitely a lot more room for growth compared to just teaching English as a foreign language. And are you going to stay in Vietnam? Or are you thinking of venturing out to other countries? Yeah, that's the question now. I, I mean, for now, I like it. I'll stay here. Um, who knows, maybe in five years, I'll get tired of it. <laughs> but, you know, um, yeah, I'm definitely open to going to other places. But at the moment, I can't really think of where I'd want to go, you know, but I'm sure like as uh, kind of my life changes and, and I don't know, the country changes and my goals change, I'll definitely reassess where I want to go. Yeah. And someone's asking, where did you obtain your TEFL? Um, I got it online. I think the company was called um, ITTT. And that one was uh, cool because it was pretty cheap, but you kind of get what you pay for, you know? And, <clears throat> you know, you do everything yourself and you uh, fill out some homework and you send it. And then I think it was like a 120 hour course. It took like a, a few months to complete. Um, another option is they have one through Cal State Long Beach, and that one you actually get more hands-on experience. Um, you're taught by really good teachers, and um, yeah, you get a lot more in-person training. So if you're really serious about teaching, I would recommend that one. But if you just want the piece of paper, you can do it online. Okay. All right, I'll let you continue. I know there's other <laughs> <Okay>. questions. But... <laughs> yeah, for sure. You through your slides, too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is like one of my favorite meals I eat every day. It's like around the corner. It costs like $1.50. It's pretty healthy. Um, but yeah, going out, has been a lot of fun. Of course, we have Domino's. They have premium Domino's. I think uh, the one on the left is uh, like Mexican beef pizza. And the one on the right is like Singapore crab. So it's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so I talked a little bit about how um, COVID affected my life here. Um, Oh, yeah. And another big thing, too, is at my job, you know, um, the company I work at is actually founded by uh, two Vietnamese guys from America, right? And so I feel like working for an, um, an American company in another country is actually pretty uh, good because they kind of understand both cultures. And so rather than laying off 25% of the workforce, everybody took a 25% pay cut, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it really affected a lot of people's lives. And then uh, before, like over the weekend, uh, Vietnam just had another spike in coronavirus cases. Like before that, they had no transmissions for over 100 days. So now everybody's thinking like, oh, is there going to be another shutdown, right? Like everybody's preparing to go all online again. Right. Yeah. And so when I couldn't teach, um, I would just continue to keep working, right? Like researching, learning things. Um, I started doing more freelance writing. I'm kind of starting uh, a career coaching business for people who want to teach abroad or maybe transition from teaching abroad to another career. And then, um, you know, I just always try to read something, always try to learn something, you know. Yeah, so yeah. now, um, yes, you have a question? No, you know, yeah, because I, I, you also got um, um, mentioned multimedia. 
-hmm. you know, freelancing and that too? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, I've done a few things for people, like kind of uh, recording like videos or promos, um, also making graphic design and things like that, mm -hmm. you know. But the thing with that is it's kind of hard to find work unless you're really promoting it all the time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for me, like the, the writing has been the best so far because you can kind of do it really quickly. And I have, I think, more practice in that too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, now I'll kind of talk about if teaching abroad is right for you, uh, what it takes to be successful teaching abroad. So I think number one is adaptability, right? Like you never know what's going to happen. So you just kind of have to roll with the punches. And then it definitely helps to be independent and to be open to uh, new ideas and experiences. And if you can learn a, a new language, that helps. Um, <clears throat> You don't have to speak the language, but if you don't speak it, like you'll have a tougher time with everything. And then, um, you know, you have to be somewhat outgoing, right? You have to take some risks. Yeah. And I think number one is just be nice. You know, um, it, it's kind of interesting because I, I feel like a lot of people move to another country because they think, okay, if I come here, this will solve all of my problems. Right. But I, what happens to a lot of people is now you just took your problems to a new place and you just left your whole support system back home, <laughs> you know? So it, it can kind of, I don't know, uh, some people can become a little mean from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're looking to uh, teach abroad, there are some national programs um, for Japan. They have the jet program and Korea has the Epic program. And you sign up for that and they can send you like anywhere in the country, right? You don't get to choose where you go. Uh, the one I did was the Okaichi English Fellows. So it's only for people from Long Beach and you will definitely go to Okaichi. Yeah, so it's a little bit more secure, you know. Like some people say, oh, yes, yeah, so I want to teach in Tokyo. And then they're in a fishing village. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you can also get jobs at independent uh, language centers. But if you work at those, you'll probably be working more at nights and on the weekends. It's kind of like after school. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, yes. Now, so when was the last time you were uh, back in Long Beach? Do you have family here? Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my mom still lives in Long Beach. And uh, my brother actually used to be a professor at Cal State Long Beach a few years ago. And I think he lives in kind of around the Torrance area now. Oh. But yeah, usually I would come back and visit about once a year. Um, the last time I was in Long Beach was from August to October. Yeah. yeah. And the, I was actually planning to visit around this time, but you know, all that's on hold now. So mm -hmm. yeah. And then, uh, like I said too, if you have your um, teaching credential, then you can work in international schools. Yeah. So if you want to get the job, right? Like you can apply before you leave the country. And that's usually how it works for those big national programs or the bigger um, chains of inner of language centers. And then um, what I did the second time is I just moved to the country and tried to look for a job, right? But it's not guaranteed. And then, you know, it could take you like three months, six months to find a job. So you have to be able to kind of float yourself until you start making money. And so, yeah, you have more freedom, but less security. And so um, after you teach um, English as a foreign language, like you can kind of get into management, like managing teachers, training teachers, designing curriculums. Um, you could also potentially start your own school, right? But you have to be very kind of entrepreneurial minded, find your own students. Um, if you have a master's degree or a PhD, right? You can move on to a higher education. And there are some jobs out here too, if you have a master's degree, like teaching English classes in college. And um, you could also go into K-12 education. You know, if you have your bachelor's degree, you can go into substitute teaching after taking the test. Um, or you can get your teaching credential. Yeah. Is there or you can just... Private, private tutoring um, possibilities? Maybe not so much as in Japan, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam, but uh, uh, is that another route? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you can definitely do private tutoring. And especially now with um, the whole situation, like everything is going online, you know. And so it really just depends on your time zone when you want to work. Um, but yeah, there are always going to be people that need that kind of individualized attention. And the thing about um, like 
teaching English in Japan is like everyone studying English, but not everyone is qualified to teach it, you know? And so sometimes people just need a conversation partner or they need someone to just check their, uh, their essays, right? Before they send them off to schools and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I think the, the market is definitely growing. Right. And then um, just to kind of wrap up how to be successful in teaching abroad or any job, right. Is um, you always want to professionally develop, right. You always want to be learning new skills and you have to work harder and smarter than other people, you know, like it's kind of unfortunate, but the job market now is like a competition, you know? So if you stand out, you have a bigger chance of being hired and promoted. And then um, you really have to be open to feedback, right? Like some people can get pretty defensive. And um, I always try to uh, give more than you get, you know? So uh, add value to people's lives, you know, and make your boss's job easier, make your students happy, and most people will love you. <clears throat> yeah. Well, so, uh, asked, uh, do you need a specialized teaching cred credential besides the TFL certificate to teach internationally? Yeah, so if you have your BA, um, you can do the JET program. If you have that uh, TEFL certificate, like there's a few different versions too. They call it TEFL, uh, TESOL, or CELTA. Those are all kind of the same thing. Um, for Vietnam, that's also a requirement for the visa. And if you want to teach in international schools, then you need that teaching credential. But um, for a lot of these other jobs, if you do have the teaching credential, like maybe it's not required, but you will get paid more or you'll be hired over somebody who doesn't have it. Yeah. And then just off the top of my head, is uh -huh. this, because um, you really have to put yourself out there. So I think it would be harder if you were married and had children and wanted to try to take this on, right? It could be, yeah. Especially, um, you know, it just makes everything a little bit more complicated, like, because you're taking care of yourself and learning how to do that. And then you're taking care of a family and learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. And then also just kind of the logistics of it, like moving around the country, you know, like mm -hmm. when I left Japan before I moved here, like I was living out of like two suitcases and a backpack, you know, like you got to travel pretty light. Um, but yeah, it can be a challenge too, you know, and then just thinking about those everyday things, like where are your kids going to go to school? Uh, what if they get sick, you know, like maybe you speak the language and then your partner doesn't speak the language, you know, like how are you going to deal with that? Um, but it's actually a pretty good teaching for international schools if you have a family because they're kind of like higher end private schools and a lot of them will say like okay if you teach here you can send your kid to the school for free you know and that can be I don't know tens of thousands of dollars a year you know and free tuition and and yeah. that's I guess why you yeah in order to work in those schools you do need your credential so that would be an important thing if you do have a spouse or children to yes, yeah. be the, the leg up. <laughs> yes, yeah, you definitely get a lot more benefits. Uh, some of them too will even give you tickets like to return home once a year, you know, so you get that for free. Um, they'll pay for your rent, things like that. So it's not only the base salary, but you get a lot more benefits on top of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so just thinking about um, the future of international education, it's kind of like, you know, the rules have changed, you know. Um, now you can't just get like a degree and, and just get like a really good job kind of how it was before. So we kind of have to hustle a little more. And I think the demand will continue to grow and a lot of it will move online. And But when you teach online, it can be kind of like big work, you know. So the hours aren't super steady. You may not have benefits. And so actually a lot of people were supposed to come and teach English in Japan this year, but now it's kind of on hold, you know, with all the travel restrictions. And from what I've heard, if the travel restrictions don't get lifted by the uh, end of September, then like everything's just canceled for the next year and they're going to roll it over to the year after. Okay. So like, yeah, for recent graduates that were counting on paying like student loans, you know, like that can be kind of, kind of tough. And then um, in the developing world, uh, like private education is kind of like a luxury, you know? Right. Yeah. So um, with, uh, with 
uh, with the, not just with COVID, but kind of the new changes in the industry, are you finding that, or pe would people even consider maybe teaching from the U.S. Uh, online to students in in other countries? Yes, yeah, that's uh, definitely that growing. Yeah, um, there's like a few uh, companies that in China that do that really, um, like they're really big players in the online English uh, field. And so you can live in America and teach kids in China, like maybe you'll make about $20 an hour and you need a bachelor's degree. Um, but the time difference is crazy. So in, chi <clears throat> sorry, in China, the, the peak hours are Monday through Friday night, like 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So if you're on the West Coast in America, maybe that's like 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., you know? So you either have to stay up super late to teach or get up early, you know? And so um, maybe if you're teaching, I don't know, about 18 hours a week, um, maybe you'll make like $1,000 a month, you know? Mm -hmm. But then again, it's kind of like working for Uber, it's 1099, you're gonna have to pay taxes on that later. So maybe you, like you can't do it full time, but it can supplement another job. You know, if you want to wake up early and get teaching experience, yeah. you know. But that'll cut into the ones that, the folks that want to actually go there and teach. Will that cut yeah. into their possibly? Oh, yeah. Well, I think the demand is growing a lot. And I I feel like maybe for the online classes, it's better for students um, who have problems traveling to places. So maybe they're like in really rural areas and they don't have an English or maybe it's cheaper than the English schools are in other places. But yeah, it's interesting to think of, like I, I could see some of the um, smaller English schools, the independent ones losing business to the big online schools. But I think like the big in-person ones will probably be there to stay, you know? And again, it just kind of shows that competition within the industry, right? Like individually between schools, like if you can adapt and um, kind of offer good services that meet the customer's needs, then you'll continue to have success. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just looking at how um, education is now, like a lot of the students are teaching themselves, you know, with, they've got their iPad, they've got their internet, and they use their touchscreen super fast. Like they're changing the YouTube video we're watching before I even know what's happening, you know. And um, I think in the future, we'll need more uh, critical thinking education and then more kind of uh, citizenship education, you know, so just kind of how to have good manners, how to uh, get along in society. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of what they'll be doing will be more based on problem solving, right? Project based collaboration, a lot of self guided learning, you know, so if we can use technology to create that flipped classroom, right, where the students learn things at home on their own then they come to class and kind of talk about it and we help them. I think that's really uh, the future of where education is going. Now, David, and, is that something that you've come up with or is that something that they are already looking at in Vietnam? Yeah, it's um, something that's kind of ongoing with education. Um, I would say definitely in Vietnam, they are moving more towards the problem based, um, like, sorry, problem solving project based classes and teamwork. But um, I think flipping the classroom is still a work in progress, you know, and it's something that you can do when you are the main teacher and you're deciding how everything's going. But usually when you're working like for an English center and, you know, you can have some students you're teaching for two or three months, like you do, don't really have enough time to develop that kind of program, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. teaching, teaching teachers uh th those processes and those new technologies is 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 another place where you can look at expanding what you do oh yeah definitely yeah like some people get jobs as uh, teacher trainers teaching consultants you know yeah. or you can even be kind of like a technology consultant for a school like come in and see what they have let them know how to do things better but um especially with the teachers too it's like they want to um, increase their skills and use more technology, but then they're already pretty busy, right? So if you're just giving them more work, then they might get burned out too, <laughs> you know? Right. So it's all kind of a balance. Yeah, you know? That's here too. That's here <laughs> yeah, too. yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of students forget that, you know, teachers are humans too. You know, we exist outside of the school. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think um, the big takeaway is just that the jobs that uh, young people will do in the future haven't been created yet, right? Technology is always changing. Like, you know, if you told me 20 years ago you could make money playing video games, I probably would have played more video games, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, because of that, as educators, we need to prepare students to figure out things on their own, right? How to think critically and solve problems. Yeah, so uh, that was it for the main part of my presentation. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to take them. Well, I know I just uh, I picked up a few other things, and I want to make sure we've we've at, gotten to all the questions. I think we have. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That I had some other questions too because mm -hmm. you are kind of a jack of all trades here, and mm, yeah. and you've uh, you've you're, you've been doing a lot of writing on like mingle app you know writing mm -hmm. and and you've also done um some writing um some um freelance writing on blogs and other things mm -hmm. so uh I, I wanted you to just kind of share that a little bit with the listeners mm -hmm. as well okay yeah so i uh probably actually really started writing um a little bit in cal state long beach when i was working with um the media board like i would go to Back then we had the Union Weekly, right? I think it changed now. But um, yeah, like if they needed an article, I would be like, okay, I can write it, you know? And then when I was in Japan, um, I made a blog about teaching in Japan. And so when I was getting ready to leave Japan, I was like, hey, I might be able to make some money doing this. And I joined a website and they just have a list of projects and you click on the one that you want to write. And then um, after you write it, you get paid, you know? And so I've done a lot of stuff like writing about teaching, um, like writing about um, like plumbing businesses, you know, um, like just all kinds of different things. I can't even remember. But like if you think about um, every website you read, right, every product you buy, like somebody had to write something for it, you know, mm -hmm. like I think one of the things I did was writing a description for uh, a bed on Amazon, you know, <laughs> like just things like that. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity out there, but uh, starting off, you won't get paid that much. Like you'll probably make more money working at McDonald's, you know, but it's a way to gain experience. And as you gain experience, then you can start charging more. Right. So um, are you, are you kind of, ha are you happy that you made the decisions you have in terms of uh, uh, moving out of the country and uh, kind of, you know, going out into the unknown <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah, it's definitely been an adventure. Um, I can say I've enjoyed it. Um, like I said, though, too, you do give up some things, though, right? Like, so you don't get to see your family as often, you know. So you're not kind of around for those everyday moments. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I feel like I've gained like a really um, different perspective on the world, you know, and just kind of life in general. And I think um, so many people just kind of pigeonhole themselves, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, okay, if I can move to Japan and I can do all this, what else can I do? You know, and it just kind of opens your mind up to possibilities. And I think um, like people who tend to go abroad, like kind of see more opportunities and everything, and they tend to limit themselves less. So I, I did notice that, that, that you do things to relax outside of work. And I, I, I was looking at some of your stuff on LinkedIn, which I would suggest anyone listening do. And you talked about lo-fi hip hop with a little jazz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does yeah, that help so, you relax? Does it help you kind of get out there and meet new people or? Yeah, definitely. Um, usually for me, that's um, what I have on in the background while I'm writing stuff and working on stuff, you know, and <clears throat> especially um, now that we're working from home, it's like, that separation between the office and the home is just gone, you know? And so anything you can do to kind of mellow out, um, you know, take some breaks, get up and just walk around your space, you know, your apartment, your house is definitely helpful, you know? So if they want to reach you, well, we're gonna talk about this at the end anyway. Uh, I would suggest they go on to your LinkedIn to see some of the other things uh, you've written on, on your own page there. And uh, if they wanted to contact you, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely uh, reach out on LinkedIn. You can just search my name like it's written there, David Logan Hader. Oh, if I can find it, anybody yeah. can find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And um, also too, like I said, I've been starting uh, that career coaching business and, you know, I'm still kind of figuring it out as I go, but um, I'm actually giving some free sessions to people so I can kind of get some experience and build some testimonials. So if you are interested in teaching abroad and you want to know more, if you think you could use some career coaching right now, definitely reach out and it'll be free of charge, you know, and you'll, you'll get what you pay for. <laughs> no, you'll learn something. It'll be fun. Now, um, how do you, one thing I wanted to know is how do you, how do you learn how to network outside of this country? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so LinkedIn is actually very good for that. And also volunteering is very good for that too. Um, because a lot of the types of people who volunteer are really outgoing, right? They work on a lot of different projects mm -hmm. and all of them know other people that are kind of like that. So um, in Japan, uh, I worked for that website, ALT Training Online, and I ran their blog section for, it'll be three years in October. And so everyone who writes a blog is like a teaching professional somewhere in Japan or somewhere in the world. And I would email with them back and forth, you know, so like, it's kind of like the, the little chit chat, you know, in between the business, like, hey, how's it going? You doing okay? Uh, we need the blog this day. Oh, yeah, I'm teaching this. Oh, that's cool, you know, and then like you kind of know each other, you know? And like something I did when I came to Vietnam too, is I just went on LinkedIn and then I searched, it's like search for people in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, search for people who went to Cal State Long Beach and like, you know, some people pop up, you know, and then just don't be shy. Send them a message like, hey, I'm new in town. I saw that you went to Cal State Long Beach. So I just wanted to say, hi, maybe we can hang out sometime. Right. How's work going for you? You know, and then that starts the conversation. Is it more difficult to find um, in-person networking with uh, organizations or volunteer activities, or are there associations that you need, you know, that you have found that have, have helped you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, uh, especially in Japan, they have um, international centers, right? And they have a lot of op opportunities for volunteering. Um, you can also find things in local magazines. Um, they still have some groups too, like they do in America, like the um, Toastmasters, right? Like if you want to get into public speaking, that's all over the world, you know? Um, so I think the biggest thing would be kind of your location, right? So if you're in a big city, they will have um, English speaking groups. But if you're in a smaller town, everything's probably going to be the local language, you know? Well, you got to learn the language anyway. <laughs> Someone's asked yeah. if you've looked at teaching anywhere, uh, like in Europe. Or are you sticking with the Asian countries? You know, um, I would uh, possibly like to teach in Europe. Like I visited Spain and I loved it. But then uh, like teaching in Europe is also a lot more competitive because everybody wants to do it, right? Everybody wants to teach in Paris and, you know, ride around on their bicycle and eat baguettes and, you know, have a, a good time, eat French food, you know. And um, when you move to a developing country, you know, like some things are a little bit tougher, you know, it's not... I don't know, like maybe just as luxurious, I would say, you know, so it's, it's like, you kind of have to go to where the opportunities are, you know, and then once you have a lot of experience, be like, oh, yeah, I taught in Vietnam for 20 years, I can teach in France, no problem, <laughs> you know, you'll have more choices. Right. Well, I know we're running out of time. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, ladies, anybody, I think we got all the questions uh, uh, answered. And they can look you up on LinkedIn. And um, any last words of wisdom, David? Uh, yeah, uh, not too much. Um, I would just say that, you know, these are pretty crazy times now, you know, and it's easy to get caught up on like how things could be different or what we could be doing better. But I'd say just try to keep making steady progress and be happy for what you have. And if you need help, ask for it. If you can help somebody out, go for it. Yeah, and I'm just going to say look up David on LinkedIn because there was like a couple of things you wrote that I read in there that were really good. I wrote up okay. a lot more notes than I even talked about today. But we want to yeah, thank yeah, you, cool. David, and I'm going to turn it over to Noemi for the uh, final. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, David, for a great insight um, on your chat today. And definitely encourage anyone on the call today to look you up on LinkedIn and network. Um, just a reminder, we can find us on social media at TSUB alumni to learn about future chats like this. And this session was recorded and it will be up on our website within the next couple of days. Thank you so much and have a great day.
Right. David, hang on for just a minute. 